Yeah. All right. Center, Actually, I should probably be. Run. Sorry. Y'all ready? Hey. Are you ready? I'm ready. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for coming. My name is Matt Warshower. I'm a professor of history at Central Connecticut State University. I'm the co-chair of the Connecticut Civil War Commemoration Commission. And uh, we are here today to pay a little bit of tribute and to uh, stand by as this Civil War statue, the forlorn soldier, uh, is leaving his what has been his home for about the last 45 years. Uh, this area didn't always look like this when he arrived. It was probably a good bit more quiet. Uh, and I, I imagine that people in this area drive by here a uh, hundred times in a hundred days and never noticed that he was here. They might live a block away and they might not know he's here and they certainly, even if they do, they might not know what, what it is that he symbolizes. This monument, uh, collectively known today as the Forlorn Soldier, was created by James Batterson, who was the founder of Traveler's Insurance. Uh, Batterson was uh, very, very much involved in Republican Party politics during the American Civil War. He was a big supporter of our, our, our wartime governor, William Buckingham. Uh, he was a huge supporter of Abraham Lincoln, and he was one of the principal monument builders, uh, not only in the state of Connecticut, but throughout the country. His monuments stand at Antietam National Battlefield, at Gettysburg National Battlefield. Uh, in, in researching this soldier, what we believe is that uh, he was built sometime between 1866 and 1869. He may ver that makes him one of the oldest Civil War monuments in the state of Connecticut. Uh, we believe that he is the oldest soldier monument. Most of the early monuments were obelisks, uh, that kind of traditional uh, funeral design, much like the, the Washington Monument in, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, to make a monument that was a soldier at this time in the late 1860s was very, very unique. He may be the first in Connecticut. Uh, he may be the first, if not one of the first, in the entire country uh, to be a soldier monument. And what we've been finding out uh, is that he may be uh, some type of model or some type of archetype for the, the Soldiers Monument and at Antietam National Battlefield, uh, a, a monument called Old Simon, which is very similar to him, much larger and made of granite. But that, that, he's significant, but that makes him that much more significant because Antietam was such uh, a tremendously horrific battle in the history of the American Civil War. It still today remains the bloodiest, single bloodiest day in American history with 23,000 men killed and wounded in 12 hours. So th this, this little old soldier uh, has, had stood in downtown Hartford for many, many years at James Batterson's workyard on the corner of, of Charter Oak Ave, uh, stood sentinel there. Uh, he was for a long time believed to have been rejected uh, because he had the wrong foot forward. He was not in parade rest, which would have had his left foot forward. We, we're pretty certain that that's incorrect. He was called for a long time, Hayfoot, old Hayfoot. Uh, and we found articles from the Hartford Current that actually discussed him in the 1930s and said that, you know, he was that soldier that the dress sergeant, the, the master sergeant, was always yelling at because he could never get things quite right. Uh, uh, we, we, however, believe that that's incorrect, that uh, we found a lot of soldiers' monuments that have the right foot forward. And so we're not exactly sure why he was never sold. Uh, there are other brownstone soldier monuments in the, in the state of Connecticut that, in fact, were created by Batterston. One of the ones we know most is uh, in Granby, Connecticut, uh, beautifully preserved by uh, Francis Miller, who is doing the work on this monument here uh, today. And so our, our plan has been, he's been in, um, in rough shape for a long time. And what we've been concerned about, he's got so many fissures and cracks, you can see that his hands are missing, his face is missing. Uh, our concern is that the freeze and thaw cycles uh, with the soft nature of brownstone that he was going to continue to deteriorate and ultimately one day we would come by out here and he would be completely fallen apart and perhaps in a, in a pile of rubble uh, just sitting at the base uh, of the monument and we didn't want that to happen. We think, feel that he's a, a significant piece of Connecticut's history, a significant, certainly a significant piece of our Civil War history uh, and so we want to uh, we want to conserve him. We want to make sure that he lasts for generations to come. Uh, I think that the forlorn soldier and the rough shape that he's in today 
uh, speaks to where we are as a generation in regards to forgetting our Civil War history. Uh, so many people have forgotten this history, this important history, and so uh, perhaps in conserving him and moving him to the State Capitol building, which we'll be doing later in the summer, uh, we can do a, a small part to remember him. Um, this project has come as the result of a lot of people. Uh, you know, I never would have been involved in this project if it weren't for Terry Wilson, who's staying in front of me. We were in her kitchen uh, last summer and she told me about him. He was originally supposed to be moved a couple of years ago and some problems arose in that. And she told me at, at uh, lunch at her house, she said, oh, you know, I'm so worried he's going to get hit by a truck. There was a lot of work done in this area, uh, construction work, and they were worried that he was going to get hit by a truck. And I had no idea. I thought that he was already in the process of being moved. And uh, so I made a few phone calls. I said, I'm going to get on top of this. And I found out that uh, he was owned by uh, the Peter Kelly family. And I said, Peter Kelly? That I know that name. Uh, <laughs> and I called my good friend Dick Judd, who was the president emeritus of Central Connecticut State University. And I said, uh, Dick, I, I need to talk to Peter Kelly and I need to talk to him fast. <laughs> and literally within three days, uh, Dick and Peter and I were at breakfast. And we sat and we talked for a, a little over an hour and he told me his family's history. Uh, his, his family had purchased the stone yard uh, directly from James Batterson and ultimately moved the stone yard here. And then in 1968 they moved the statue here uh, because the stone yard in, in uh, downtown Hartford had been closed down. And they wanted to, to save this guy. And he has actually been privately owned by the Kelly family. Uh, and still continues to be owned to this day by the Kelly family, but, but not much longer because Peter has uh, generous, generously uh, agreed to donate the monument to the state of Connecticut so that it can be placed in the Capitol building. This would not be possible, as I said, without a lot of people's help. Uh, from Terry to Dick to Peter, uh, the, the, the Kelly family has generously provided funding for this to, to properly conserve the statue and to move him, and Traveler's Insurance has provided funding for this. And Traveler's has been our, our really our key commemoration partner since uh, the beginning of getting involved in commemorating Connecticut's involvement in the Civil War. And you know, I made a, a, a phone call to the foundation at Traveler's and I said, boy, I got a story for you. I talked to my friend Tara there and I said, I have got a story for you. And I told her about the monument, I told her about Batterson, and the way that Travelers has always been with us, um, they, I, I think that they like what we're doing uh, in, in trying to remember this history. And, and the most beautiful thing to hear from a foundation is, what can we do to help? And I said, you know, I, I really need some funding. And, and Tara said, all right, I'll get started on this. And what more can you ask for from a community partner than that? So I, I really thank Travelers. I thank the Kelly family for their help with this. And uh, so now, uh, this, there's, there's so many people who are connected to this, and please, please, come, come over, please. Of Michael Hagen Kelly, one of the two Kelly brothers that bought the Stone Yard from Batterson yeah. in 1886. And we have one great grandson here, but there are lots of us. And, uh, <laughs> so this is being done by the Kelly family. Uh, I'm going going back two generations. Yeah. And we're delighted to be here. A lot of Kellys. So thank you. Thank you for your help and thank you for your support. So with that, uh, when I sent out an email to people saying we're going to be moving this guy on July 19th, I got a, uh, uh, an email back from uh, Tom Callahan, who was our first Connecticut State Troubadour, and he said, I've been wanting to write a, a, a song about the forlorn soldier for years. And so, you know, I, I, you, you inspired me to write this song. And so he's going to perform the song for the first time for us right now. Okay? Tom? Axe handles, in case you're wondering. Here you go. <laughs> uh, it's great to be here. I don't remember when I first saw this uh, monument, but it was many, many 
many years ago and I just uh, was knocked out by it that it was there and so badly abused and what was the story and anyway um, thank you Matt for letting me do this uh, as of yesterday I had a different melody so we have no idea where this is going <laughs> new melody last night pray for me <laughs> this guitar is from 1880 and it does unusual things in the weather as do I alright we'll give it a shot the forlorn soldier Take two. Just as many a soldier returning from war has been shunned by the public because of his scars, one forlorn soldier has silently stood, neglected, abused, and misunderstood. Abandoned in Hartford for a century or more, statue and brownstone to remember the war that divided our nation then brought us together fell victim to vandals and the harshness of weather he said you cannot get blood from a stone and a heart of stone can't feel like our own but anguish cries out from those brownstone cheeks and those silent this soldier speaks. Without words he speaks of profound disrespect. He was shown where two Hartford streets intersect. He speaks to the shame upon shame that was seen by those who bore witness but did not intervene. Except for his foot placement, he would have been in an honored spot at a park or a green. But rejected, he languished, standing alone, and over time was disfigured by whom is not known. Tis said you cannot get blood from a stone, and a heart of stone can feel like our own. But anguish cries out from those brownstone cheeks and those silent This soldier speaks Disarmed and distressed, both hands amputated, desecrated and callously mutilated why did the culprits not care or not see that he represented the land of the free? But among us are those who thankfully choose to protect such things from wanton abuse, who manage to give these rare treasures their due for the general good in spite of the few. Tis said you cannot get blood from a stone And a heart of stone can't feel like our own But anguish cries out from those brownstone cheeks And those silent, this soldier speaks Tis said you cannot get blood from a stone And a heart of stone can't feel like our own Anguish cries out from those brownstone cheeks and those silent. This soldier speaks, and those silent. This soldier speaks, and those silent. This soldier All right, so let me just very briefly explain what, what's happening with him. Uh, we've asked uh, Francis Miller, excuse me, 
We've asked Francis Miller to do uh, some basic work on this. You can see that he's got some holes drilled in it. And what he's doing is stabilizing. He's drilled it. He's placed hollow rods in it. And then he's a injected epoxy into it to shore it up and make sure that it's nice and stable, that it won't flake anymore, that it won't fall apart. What's happening today is that it's going to be uh, picked up. Uh, the movers have arrived while we've been speaking. They're going to pick it up. They're going to put it on their truck. They're going to take it down to Mr. Miller's stone yard in Hamden. And they are going to do a bunch of work on him to, to clean him up, to, to wash him, to, uh, to uh, treat him, make sure that everything looks good. And then ultimately, sometime over the next uh, month, he's going to be moved inside the state capitol building. And on September 17th, which is an extremely important day in uh, Civil War history. That, that is the anniversary of the Battle of Antietam. It is the anniversary of when we uh, dedicated the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Arch in downtown Hartford. On that evening, September 17th, we will uh, properly and formally dedicate him to the Capitol building. And I will be dressed up and looking much more formal uh, at that occasion. So uh, again, thank you all very much for coming out. Uh, it's. I think in some ways a small thing what we're doing, but it's a big thing nonetheless. So thank you all very much again. By company, ready. And bar, load. presentation for the day. Thank you for coming out. I want to especially thank our, our Civil War living historians who, when we ask them to do something, it's amazing how they react and come out uh, and wear wool. And wear wool. <laughs> in hot weather. So thank you all very much for coming. Appreciate it. That the generations to come might know them.